<clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm Louis Andaloro, Vice President of the Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council. I'll be the moderator of um, this evening's Zoom program, Creek Stewardship, a panel discussion. The Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council is a local 501c3 nonprofit environmental group with no paid staff, just hardworking, hardworking board and volunteers. Our focus is to encourage the preservation, protection, and restoration of both urban and natural streams in our home region. Our goal is to educate and influence both the general public and decision makers with regards to our local watersheds. Water quality and fish passage are two really important issues for the Urban Creeks Council. Uh, the critically important aesthetic, recreational, and ecological values provided by our local watersheds are too often taken for granted. We hold regular meetings, we develop educational materials, we host uh, public programs and workshops, we conduct tours of local creeks, we do creek cleanups, uh, we work with public agencies, uh, other nonprofits, and uh, the general public on a variety of watershed issues. And um, we would gratefully accept any donations anybody would like to, to make to us. Um, next, we have Creek Week, which all of you obviously know we're in the middle of from the 18th to the 25th of uh, this month. The organizer of this uh, Creek Week set of events is uh, Liz Smith, the uh, Creeks Outreach Coordinator for the City of Santa Barbara. There's a wide variety of, pro of uh, programs this week. Uh, the Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council will be presenting uh, two more programs. Uh, tomorrow night's will be uh, industrial cannabis in the Arroyo Borough, in the Arroyo, excuse me, Arroyo Paradone watershed at 7 p.m. And our Friday program is uh, homelessness in the environment also at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, you can get the schedule and uh, the details on our website or email lists or go to Creek Week 2021 for the full schedule of all the events. Tonight's program will feature four local creek stewards and it's the kickoff event for the Urban Creek Council's Creek Stewardship Outreach Program. Um, that our uh, first speaker, uh, Urban Creeks Council Board Member Ann Burdett will be able to tell you more about that. Um, after um, I introduce the four panelists and they give their presentations, we'll uh, open it up to question and answers and that'll be on the uh, chat function. So starting with our panelists, panelist number one is Ann Burdett. She's a third year environmental studies student at UCSB. She's passionate about sharing her love of uh, nature with others in hopes that our efforts will inspire others to respect and protect our local watersheds, both for all of us today and for future generations. She joined the board in 2017 as a 10th grade student after working with UCC president, Dan McCarter, to document sensitive species in the, Los Arroyo, in the lower Arroyo Borough watershed prior to its restoration. Our next panelist, George Johnson, is the lead restoration specialist for the city of Santa Barbara's Creeks Division. He has 20 years of creek restoration experience with the city and has implemented a number of successful creek restoration projects and programs that you'll be talking about tonight. He's a graduate of UCSB with a degree in environmental studies. When he's not working, he's usually either surfing or hiking. Next, we have uh, Mauricio Mogomez. He has almost 20 years of experience working on habitat restoration projects in the Santa Barbara and Ventura region. He enjoys managing restoration projects, which build partnerships between a diverse group of landowners, government agencies, and other nonprofit groups and the public. Um, Mo and uh, South Coast Habitat Restoration are focused on teaching people the value in, of environmental restoration of our local watersheds while encouraging people to work together for the common good. He's a Southern California native living, live, living in the Santa Barbara area for the last 26 years. He has a bachelor's degree from UCSB. He is the founder and director of South Coast Habitat Restoration and has been on the boards of both CERCAL, the Society for Ecological Restoration in California and Citizens for the Carpentry of Bluffs. 
In his spare time, he enjoys hiking, running, and spending quality time with his family in the great outdoors. I added the great outdoors part, Mo. <laughs> and then uh, finally, we have Natasha Lomas. She's worked for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for 43 years. 43, she began, no. she began her career um, working in on inland fisheries. She then became a game warden and then an environmental scientist with an emphasis on protecting wetlands and streams in California's habitat restoration program. Most of her recent work in Santa Barbara County was focused on steelhead restoration. After retiring a few years ago, she went back to work for the uh, department working on illegal water diversions and environmental violations as a liaison to the Santa Barbara District Attorney's Office, or Santa Barbara District Attorney's uh, Task Force on Environmental Crimes. She served for nine years on the Santa Barbara Creeks Committee and several years on the Carpinteria Creeks Committee with Mo Gomez, where they were able to remove all of the steelhead passage barriers on Carpinteria Creek. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to Ann. Thank you, Lewis. I will try to share my screen. Okay, I've got it. So as Lewis said, my name is Ann Verdette and I have been on the board of Urban Creeks Council since I was in high school. And I'm also currently studying environmental studies at UCSB. And what led me to Urban Creeks Council was the passion that I've always had for nature and the local wildlife. I grew up here and I was lucky to have a lot of opportunities when I was little to explore nature, whether it's in my own yard or in the local open spaces and parks that I'd go to with my family. Like in that picture on the left, that was in Carpentry Salt Marsh. I used to chase lizards on the pathway there. I'd watch owls in the Mesa Park. I'd turn over rocks and creeks and look for tadpoles and all kinds of things like that. And as I've grown up, I've wanted to find ways to give those kinds of experiences to other people in the community, like people of all ages, all generations, and help people coexist with wildlife and preserve the same spaces that I've always loved to go to so that current and future generations can explore them too. When I was in ninth grade, I was starting to look for opportunities to get involved with that kind of thing. And I saw an article in the Mesa paper about the Arroyo Bro open space, which is across Las Positas from Ealings. And it had been saved from development and the city was in the process of acquiring it to do a creek restoration there and preserve it as an open space. And the article was talking about a project where the author was looking at sensitive species around the creek bank and mapping their locations to better inform the creek restoration. And that project sounded like it was right up my alley. So I emailed the author of the article who turned out to be Dan McCarter, who was now the president of Urban Creeks Council and was a board member at that time. And I offered to volunteer for the project and he took me up on the offer. So I ended up working with him to map the nests of dusky footed wood rats, which you can see in this picture. They are a species of rodent that they're unlike a lot of other like rodent species. They're not really known to bother humans. They live in riparian areas and oak woodlands and they build these stick houses like you can see on the picture on the left. And they're an environmentally sensitive species. They have ecological roles. Like, I mean, obviously they provide a, a prey source for predators, but they also provide homes for other animals in their stick houses. Like I think mice and like reptiles have been known to live in the stick houses with them. And they're also like a good indicator species for the health of the ecosystems that they live in. And so we were mapping their nests so that the, during the creek restoration, they could help preserve them. And after about a year of working on that project, Dan told me that Urban Creeks Council was looking for more board members and he thought that I would be a good fit based on my work on this project. So that was when I joined the board. I was in 10th grade then, and now I've been on the board for a little over four years. And because of my interest in getting more people engaged with nature, 
one of my specific focuses on the board has been to expand our public outreach programs. And over the past year, that's turned into developing this neighborhood creek stewardship program. And it started with a few emails from people who live next to creeks and they were contacting us about how they could get involved with protecting their creek. And then for a final project in one of my UCSB classes last year, I decided to work on a more formal outline of a program to give those people an opportunity to get involved. And now we're trying to put that program into action and get people involved in protecting creeks near them in whatever way fits their interests and the needs of the watershed. And the main idea of the program is that every one of us lives in a watershed, which a watershed is an area of land where water that falls on that land will eventually run off into a specific body of water like a creek. And for example, like I'm in the watershed of Lighthouse Creek, which flows under the bridge at La Mesa Park. And if you don't know what watershed you live in, just let us know and we can help you find out. We have all kinds of creek maps and like everyone lives near a creek and in a watershed, as you can probably tell on this map, even if you don't know the name of the creek, you probably live next to one. And it's important to protect our watersheds because not only do the creeks just channel water to the ocean, they also provide ecological services. Like they filter water, they filter the pollutants out before it reaches the ocean. They can, in some cases, act as natural fire breaks. They can provide areas for recreation. I'm sure that we all know of hiking trails or bike paths that are near creeks because it's just a nice place to be. And of course, they're also home to a lot of species of native flora and fauna, including some that are threatened or endangered, like the steelhead trout, which is an endangered species. And it's been seen in some creeks in Santa Barbara and other creeks have also been listed as potential habitat to bring it back to. And anyways, like we're trying to help community members develop more of a connection with the creeks in their watersheds by becoming what we're calling a creek steward, which can mean different things to different people depending on your interests and the needs of the watershed that you live in. But it generally just means being engaged with the monitoring and the protection of the creek that you live by. And like one of the simplest ways to do that would just be to go down to the creek regularly and see if there's any issues that might need to be addressed or even just like see what's going on. If you notice anything that you're curious about, like you could let us know and we could help you figure out what that might be. Or like if you notice potential problems with erosion, like we could refer you to an agency that could help you deal with that. And in addition to that ongoing monitoring of the creek, some people might want to take it to another level and incorporate projects like water quality testing or like like there's kits that you can get for that that measure the pH and like the level of different pollutants in the water. Or like some people might want to be involved in activism about local issues that could be affecting their creek. Like if you go to the forum tomorrow night, you'll hear from Maureen, who is kind of a creek steward in Carpinteria, who is taking an approach like that to be an activist about the potential impacts of industrial cannabis on her creek. And some people might want to be involved in habitat restoration, and some people might want to take like a leadership role and help educate their neighbors about the creek or lead creek cleanups. And even if you don't want to have a role like that, there's kind of an opportunity for everyone to get involved. You don't need a lot of experience. I mean, I got involved with, with the Urban Creeks Council when I was like 14 and had not really any experience. Or if you don't want to commit a lot of time, like there's still things that you can do to help your creeks. And our role in the program will mainly be as a resource and a mentor to the people who want to be creek stewards. We can like provide the training, like we could show you what to look out for in terms of native versus invasive plants. If you've ever seen this plant, it's called a rundodonax, and it's a very invasive plant that not only takes over habitat from native plants, 
but also can lead to flooding and erosion issues. And so we can like show you things like that to look out for, and we can help connect you with local experts and agencies and like the other panelists in this forum and anyone who can help you with the specific issues in your watershed. We can provide supplies and training for any specific projects that you want to do. Like if you want to organize a creek cleanup, we've done that before and we have the experience and we can help teach you how to do that. And we can also just help keep each other in the loop about any current events that might be going on that could be affecting the creek. Like if there's a development proposed that's nearby the creek or if there's like a potential for a big habitat restoration project that you could get involved in, we can keep each other aware of that. And we're excited about this program because it can be beneficial in so many different ways. Like it's not only protecting the creeks, which it obviously will because if more people are looking out for them, then like problems are more likely to get addressed. But it will also be beneficial to the communities because it will get more people out in nature and give them those kind of opportunities and hopefully also help them find like a sense of belonging in their neighborhood. Like, especially in neighborhoods where someone wants to kind of take the lead and educate others about the creeks, like that could just get more of the neighbors like engaged with the community. And there's, there's kind of something for everyone. So I hope that everyone here got some ideas on how they could get involved. And I encourage you to contact us if you want to be a creek steward in whatever capacity that means to you. This is our email address. You can also find that on our website. And I'm usually the one checking the email. So just contact us and we can help you get involved with protecting your creek. Thank you for listening. And we'll move on to the next panelist, I think. Thank you very much, Anne. And uh, I just wanted to add real quickly that uh, this program is being recorded and um, it and the other programs we're putting on this week will be on our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, our next uh, panelist to speak is uh, George Johnson with the city of Santa Barbara. Take it away, George. Hello, everybody. So I'm, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the city's done and mentioned one's uh, location where we've done a restoration project uh, at the Royal Borough Open Space. Um, and we've got quite a few others in the city. We are currently working on a project there. So if you guys are seeing all the construction associated with the bike path on Las Positas Creek, we're also connecting to that bike path with a footbridge so that you can access the Royal Borough Open Space from the north end of the parcel rather than just at the end of Allen Road. So that will hopefully help more people enjoy that open space and uh, see how the restoration's going, learn more about the creeks and all that kind of stuff. So today I'll probably, I'm not gonna talk too much about what the city's done. I'll, I'll cover a little bit of it. We've done rest, and, but I'd like to just uh, follow up on what Ann was saying and talk a little bit about creek issues and how people might get involved. So at the city, uh, we're fortunate that we have a dedicated source of funding to do restoration and purchase creekside properties in which to do that restoration on. And, and that's pretty rare in, in even in California um, where, where creeks in some locations are, are uh, respected a lot. People, uh, often these communities still don't have the funds to do restoration or purchase creekside land. So we do have that in Santa Barbara and, and are very fortunate. And so we try to use that money to do that very thing, which is restore these creeks where possible. So in urban areas, this can be very limiting due to uh, development adjacent to the creeks. And that's why those uh, larger parcels like the Royal Borough Open Space that we've been able to purchase allow us to do bigger rest restoration projects that have better natural function and better water, water quality uh, filtration potential because we can actually construct floodplains that are pretty much non-existent in most urban creeks. And what a floodplain is, is it's just a lower bench or area adjacent to a creek that allows the water to 
go up above that bench during times of floods that reduces the energy and scour of the creek. So that reduces erosion and provides additional capacity for floods. In most urban areas, these floodplains have been eliminated in order to develop either roads or urban development or previously agriculture adjacent to the creek to get as much arable or developable land as possible. And when you narrow the creeks and put development next to it, what happens is if they cannot spread out, they go down. And that's what's called down cutting. And that uh, basically creates the situation you see in a lot of urban creeks where you walk up to the edge of the creek and the creek's not 10 or five feet below the bank, it's like 15 or 20 or 30 feet below the bank. And you can sometimes not even see it, it's so far down. So that's typically not natural for the lower portions of the creeks. And in that state, you cannot, uh, the banks are very unstable. So that creates erosion, which puts sediment into the creek. Um, it limits the uh, flood capacity of that creek. And it also, uh, it also prevents riparian trees um, and other plants from reaching the water down in the creek itself. When you have a floodplain, those plants are able to, able to reach down into the creek and uh, take advantage of that moisture that's go, that, that the creek is providing. When you are disconnected from that high up on a creek bank, it's hard to grow plants. Plus the vertical banks make it very difficult. So the reason I'm explaining all of this is that having space adjacent to your creek is vitally important in order to do restoration projects. You can't really do effective restoration projects when you have homes right at the top of the creek banks or other development. It just doesn't provide you enough space to create a stable creek bank and um, still uh, using plants without using concrete walls or a lot of rocks or, and other hard structures that limit the planting in the creek and make for not a very natural setting, not very good for the species that depend on the riparian areas. So anyway, what I was gonna say is, is that part of uh, what you can do as a creek steward is if you are, as, as may be talked about tomorrow night, is that one thing you can do is just be aware of what's going on in your creeks. And if there is uh, especially large developments proposed adjacent to creeks, that if, if you are a steward of that area, you can provide your input to the decision makers on what the appropriate setback is for that new development. And in the city of Santa Barbara, we do have certain regulations as well as the county does and other cities like Carpinteria and Goleta. The city has a 25 foot setback for Mission Creek for development, but the other creeks, it does not have any setback. And so all those decisions are made on a case by case basis. But I just encourage people, that's one way to get involved and help to preserve the creek resources is to make sure that there's enough space adjacent to them between the development to um, do that type of restoration. And um, another way you can get, another thing that is important for people to realize about creeks are they are not all publicly owned. There's often a misconception about creeks that if it's in a creek, it's, you know, it's publicly owned. You can walk up and down it and, and, and that's okay. Well, that's not really the case. Most of the creeks in, um, in our area are privately owned. I think in other countries like England, they have uh, rules and laws that the, the creeks are actually public spaces. But here in the US, we do not have uh, a law that's that ov overrides every every you know other um, uh, local law that provides uh, basically public access to all those creek areas. So many of them are privately owned. There are public open spaces on creeks also. So those are the appropriate places for you to access the creek unless you have approval from the private landowners. 
And um, I just want to mention that because I don't want people to be surprised when they're walking around in the creek and all of a sudden somebody says, hey, what are you doing on my property? And, and you get in a big argument about it or something because it's not public space typically. So uh, having said that, uh, I think it's good for people to know that and, and know that, but that there are many places that, that they still can access the creek and watch it and, and help to clean up and do, and, and do other things that, uh, that assist um, uh, the health of the creek in general. We at the Creeks Division, we have a hotline that allows you to call in if you see anybody polluting, not even just in the creek, but anywhere in a watershed. We have programs uh, and then we have the ability to go out and, and use our contractors to clean up sections of the creek. If you notice an area that's particularly dirty or trashy, you can always, you can work with Liz in the city creeks to uh, do creek cleanups. Um, she can help out with that and uh, organize those kind of events. We do have planting events as part of our larger restoration projects. Um, we do have something called the Creek Tree Program. So if you live on the creeks in the city of Santa Barbara, or you know someone who does, we have a program that plants riparian trees on your property and pays for that planting and removes invasive plant species, um, larger bushes and trees. So uh, if you are interested in doing that, that is important for creeks. Ripar the riparian canopy is probably, it's kind of like the kelp forest to the ocean. It's very, it's the foundational part of the biological and even the structural part, it helps to hold the banks in place. It provides shade for the creek and provides habitat for the birds and provides organic material and all kinds of important things. So that tree canopy is really important. And that's why I tried to concentrate on that in the urban areas as a start for restoration, in, especially in those areas that are too confined already with development to really come in and do any significant larger uh, creek restoration projects. So I think that's all I have to say right now. I just wanted to provide you some of that information about the creeks, what a little bit of what we do. I'll, in closing, I'll say we have restoration projects right now in the works for the bird refuge at the end of Palermo Drive. And um, we're starting one on Oak Park. Um, in the city of Santa Barbara, we're going to be doing some more restoration in the creek channel there. So those are some of the future projects. In the past, we've done quite a few, num a number of projects on Arroyo Borough Creek, Honda Valley, Hidden Valley on Arroyo Borough, Barger Canyon, which is a, a tributary to Arroyo Borough, on Mission Creek. We have done a project on um, in Oak Park already, or actually two projects there. Um, so those are just an example of a few projects that we've done in the past. And uh, if you guys have any questions, obviously during the question part, you can ask me. So thanks. Uh, thank you very much, George. Um, before I move on to the next speaker, I just wanted to mention that Santa Barbara is very developed. So there really isn't really much creek habitat in the city itself. Yet um, Goleta has a lot of open space on their creeks. And uh, in the last few years, the Environmental Defense Center working with the Urban Creeks Council, working with the city of Goleta has established a mandatory 100 foot creek setback for all new development in Goleta. That leads to higher water quality, uh, better wildlife habitat, cooler temperatures, higher property values. Um, and for those reasons, it's uh, you know, really important to be looking at our local creeks. Um, with that said, let's move on to our next panelist, uh, Natasha Lomas. Hi, I'm, I have a um, PowerPoint presentation. I hope that can be put on. Yeah. Um, I'm here to talk mainly about uh, what to look for in creeks, what's legal, what isn't legal. Um, and if you're walking through the creek, and if, I'm hoping people will become uh, creek stewards. I, you, you have to know what people are doing, if it's le legal or not, or if you want to report them. 
Now, there are a lot of agencies, and I'll give you a um, phone number at the end for Caltip for our department. Okay, our, the State Department of Fish and Wildlife's jurisdictional boundaries are from the top of bank to top of bank if no riparian vegetation exists. So that is basically includes the high water area. So the top of bank as measured at a normal high water flow, not a huge flood, but normal high water. But if you have a riparian zone, it is the outside drip line of the riparian zone, whichever is the widest. Next, please. So here's a diagram of our jurisdiction, and this diagram shows adjacent wetlands, which we're not going to see a whole lot of in Santa Barbara County. But if you look on your left, um, this diagram didn't include the outside drip line, so it's slightly modified from the original. But you can see the, the state pretty much takes the largest jurisdiction. Next. So the definition of stream, it's any channel of water flows at least during large rain events. It may be just flows one time a year, like in the desert for episodic, or it could have um, year round water. And it doesn't have to be a blue line on any map. The blue line was actually put in to delineate creeks and maps, but since we, we do not use that uh, definition at all. So if it has a defined bed, bank, and channel, regardless of size, it is our jurisdiction. Next. So if sen somebody wants to do a project, and that includes uh, anybody, even um, other agencies, cities, counties, 5013Cs, they have to get a stream bed agreement. And it's, um, I can't say it's an easy process, but that's the only way to actually have a project. Now, if you want to pick up trash, that's not a project. You don't need any permits. Next. So there's other agencies with jurisdiction. Now, the Corps of Engineers uh, covers the two year high water mark. So their jurisdiction is much smaller. The State Water Quality Control Board usually um, monitors siltations, dumping, um, pollution cases and creeks. NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service is the agency that lists steelhead and tidewater gobias endangered. So those two species are federally endangered. Now the state, uh, Fish and Wildlife, does protect steelhead and does projects for restoration of steelhead but we are all permitted through NOAA to be able to do that. So then there's the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which is also a federal agency. Their jurisdiction is red and yellow leg frogs. And we have the County of Santa Barbara planning, which is flood control. And there's the Forest Service on forest land. Next. There are a lot of things that can damage creeks. Narrowing the channel. Now, this is a physical uh, issue with like concrete banks. This dec decreases the capacity of flows and it narrows the, the, the water flow. So the water actually starts to increase velocity. And as soon as the channel widens again, that's where you have the majority of the erosion. So it's really actually the worst thing in the world is to um, decrease capacity of a channel. You want to make it as wide as you possibly can. Adding sediment, same principle. What you're doing is bringing up the bottom of the channel and you're decreasing capacity and, you're, and you rest, run the risk of covering gravels, which <clears throat> steelhead require for spawning. Placing yard waste or debris, same difference. Uh, decreases capacity, but in a different way. Uh, one of my favorite cases was San Ysidro Creek, just above the 101 freeway. This is many, many years ago. A, uh, I think he had a lemon orchard or avocado orchard. He decided to be a good sport and cut down the, the um, eucalyptus trees that grew on his bank. But he left all the huge chunks of eucalyptus 
and large trunk pieces in the bottom of the channel. So when the rains came, all that material plugged the 101 bridge and flooded out the freeway completely. The road was shut down for, I believe, two days, and the county did wind up filing a lawsuit on this person. Next. You always have to think what your action will do downstream. Uh, if you have heavy equipment in, a, in flowing water, that is going to kill everything within that area. The worst thing anybody can do in a creek is build something with concrete and not divert the flows. Concrete has a pH of 13 and 9 can kill trout. It actually takes 28 days to completely dry. And there's a fishing game code section 5650 that prevents people from putting anything deleterious in creeks. And concrete is probably the most deleterious thing you can put in there. Constructing any fish barrier, especially in Santa Barbara, most of our creeks are under critical habitat jurisdiction and even something like an Arizona crossing, which is a concrete uh, lining of the channel, will eventually um, be cause a fish barrier. The water velocity increases over the concrete and forms a scour pool on the downstream side. <clears throat> and, and then that causes fish passage problems. Landscaping with non-native trees. I'll have more about that later. Um, but you want to have a good, healthy native vegetation on the banks that will prevent erosion and that creek from leaving its channel and undermining structures. Already talked about constricting flows. One of the worst things is undersized culverts and bridges. Anytime you see something from the East Coast where a road washes out, that's because the, the culvert was not sized for high velocity flows. Um, one culvert is always better than three small culverts. Uh, the, where the culverts interact catches debris and then you're plugging up your cul culverts and you're gonna have a huge washout. Of course, using herbicide and pesticides are a no-brainer. And you will see in Montecito uh, and Santa Barbara, a lot of patios, stairs, lead down to the bottom of the creek. Those all can restrict flows as well. Next, please. I think George talked about non-native plants. I'd like to get a little more specific. Ivy is very invasive and is the best habitat for rats. Car um, Montecito has a huge rat population, mainly because of citrus, avocado, and ivy. Uh, great projects are removing that stuff. And it actually burns because it has woody stems. So it's not, um, does not prevent fire whatsoever. And what you want for fire prevention is moisture content. Anything that has a lot of moisture will burn slower or won't burn at all. And you would think that ivy wouldn't burn, but it does. It's also toxic to fit fish and very shallow roots. Eucalyptus, extremely flammable and messy, and it keeps other plants from going underneath it. Vinca, nasturtiums, you see a lot of that. Same thing, shallow roots, rat habitat, and kills all the native plants underneath. And palms actually can impede stream flows and divert stream flows and is very flammable. Next. <laughs> Here's an example of Rundo. This is Carpinteria Creek. Uh, this is now gone, but it, it take, it's very hard to kill. So it's a huge project to get rid of Rundo. And it makes also very good homeless habitat. Next. So the other bad species are Myoporum, um, toxin, toxic and highly flammable. Pampas grass, same problem, Tamaris and Rundo. All of these should not grow on any creek and they should be removed if possible. Next. Of course, native plants are what we want because they evolved to our climate. They are used by native wildlife for food, shelter, nesting sites. 
we have a greater diversity with native plants. And uh, George talked about creating a canopy. Well, that's extremely important for steelhead because it keeps the water temperatures low and reduces weed and algal, algal growth. And fish need low temperature water because cooler water holds more oxygen. As soon as the water temperatures go up, you're going to have fish dying. Of course, food sources, insects, bees, and it actually wa filters water, traps contaminants, and improves ground quality. And the, my biggest argument for native plants, bank stabilization. Willows being probably the best root system to keep your bank in place. Next. Uh, sycamores for nesting sites, coast live oak for food sources for wildlife, cottonwood, they are, they have cavities and cavity nesters like woodpeckers use them, owls use cottonwood. Again, we're, uh, royal willow for bank stabilization, very fast growing, and elderberry, one of my favorite plants. Everybody can eat elderberries, birds, mammals, and including us. Next. California wild rose. Um, I love wild roses because they keep people out and they smell great. Uh, creeping wild rye and giant wire are, are grasses that provide seeds for birds. Mugwort is a very gr wonderful wetland plant. Um, of course, we use it, as you can see here, to lessen the effects of poison oak. Yerba mansa and sage also attracts bees and other insects. Next. For wildlife. When people remove riparian vegetation, especially in the springtime, they are not going to see all the nests. If you're looking at hummingbirds, that nest is tiny. Nobody is going to find that nest, and we are losing our hummingbird population. Next. So there is a bird nesting season. It's a general season from March 1st to August 15th. There are some species, two riparian species that go to December 15th. So basically in that time of year, you cannot legally remove any bird nest. You can still work during the nesting season for emergencies, but that vegetation requires bird nesting surveys to make sure that you're not going to be taking any active nests. So if you want to have to prove trees for whatever reason, you got to do it when they're dormant. And if you do have active nests in any development project or bridge construction project, there is a 50 foot buffer for raptors, including owls, and 300 feet for all other species. Now that's, there's a caveat there. There are some species like um, house finches that you could probably work within 10 feet and they will not be impacted. This is kind of a general, um, the 300 feet is kind of a general guideline and you'd have to probably contact a biologist to get a waiver for um, a closer buffer. So section 3503 of the Fish and Game Code protects all birds and nests and 35.03.5 protects raptors and their nests. So if something happens and you have to, there's a tree that's going to file, fall across a road if it's not immediately removed and there is a raptor nest. There are mitigations you can follow and you would take that nest to the local raptor center and I think the amount of cost, there will be a cost of, I think it's from the top of my head about a thousand dollars because that's how much it costs to raise to four raptors to from egg to fledging. Next. And our species of fish, of course, is the steelhead. This is on Maria Ignacia down on underneath the bridge at Patterson Avenue. Next.
As mentioned before, they are listed federally. You cannot fish legally in any stream that is under um, the critical habitat area. And that pretty much includes most of all the streams in the Santa Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, Goleta, all the way to Gaviota. There are exceptions uh, um, above uh, Kachuma Dam. They're native here. They have been found. Uh, unfortunately, we, the numbers are low for adult fish. Now, the reason they haven't disappeared entirely is because a six inch fish actually can spawn. And sometimes these fish are trapped upstream where there are seeps and year round pools. So that's basically why we still have these fish. Uh, Montecito had a wonderful population. They pretty much wiped out, they were wiped out during the debris flow, but we are seeing, now when I say few, under, you know, you could probably count them on one hand. A few of the fish are coming, have come back, but nothing that would be sustaining at this point. They were going to have to increase their numbers. And there are, this community has had millions of dollars added through grants and projects to modify barriers just to allow these fish to re reach their spawning grounds. Next. This is the one that City of Santa Barbara did in Oak Park on Mission Creek. Um, what happens is if we, they, we have um, hard bottoms under bridges, the fish can't get through them. The water become the increases velocity because it's, it's not a rough and channel and it spreads out in a shallow. So this kind of structure will allow the fish to migrate and the water in these slots will be deeper and they can rest on the sides and that gives the fish an opportunity to move upstream. Next. Okay, steelhead migrate just after storm flows have peaked. The water's gonna be muddy and people are gonna say, there's no fish here. Well, they are there. You're just not gonna see them when they migrate. They have to get up high to spawn where water's perennial and I mentioned already the cool water for dissolved oxygen to survive. Canopy keeps the water cool. And um, a problem with non-native plants is that some use more water than the native plants and will cause drying in creeks. Next. Okay, there are certain things that will not be permitted by the state for any reason. Culverts in critical steelhead habitat. If you see somebody putting in a culvert, contact Fish and Wildlife. Um, they can have oversized bottomless culverts or span bridges, or if there's absolutely no steelhead and it's a very ephemeral creek, that might be allowed, but not in any uh, steelhead creeks at all. Same with Arizona crossings. Um, the structures have to be no higher than 12 inches for the fish, smaller fish to be able to jump upstream if there's a uh, grade control structure. And the larger fish, of course, can jump over barriers much higher. But again, I, as I mentioned, six inch fish can spawn and we wanna get them up where there's water. We don't allow gabions anymore. Those are the rock filled baskets. We used to see them in all our creeks. Well, the problem is, um, Reptiles don't have a reverse gear. So if they get into these gabions, they cannot get back out and then they're stuck and it's a take. I uh, mentioned already concrete or hard structures. Uh, the only time that's allowed if there's absolutely no other option and you know the bank is like the house is teetering type of thing. And of course, no dumping of any waste and no water diversions without permits, especially in steelhead. Next. Um, water rights are a huge issue. There's two types, riparian and appropriative. I'm not even going to touch appropriative. The laws are a mess. And those are usually the older rights. Um, the larger ranches have those. But if you have a piece of property 
on a creek, you can have riparian rights. But it's not just putting a sump pump in there and taking the water to water your lawn. Especially if it's a steelhead creek, that would could be considered take. So even if you have riparian rights, you don't need a permit from the state, but you have to notice notify the State Water Quality Control Board, you have to have a way of measuring how much water you take, when you take it. The water must be used for beneficial use only, like watering a crop would be an example of beneficial use, but it has to stay on the same parcel of land. You can't divert the water to a neighbor's property or to another parcel of land that that, that property owner owns across the street. You also can't store it, that water, for more than 30 days. I didn't put that in there. Anyway, even if you have riparian rights, you cannot have a structure to divert the water or peat still had migration. So you can't build a little dam or divert the water into a, some sort of basin. And then you cannot take all the water. You have to leave enough water flow to downstream reaches to provide for wildlife. Next. So if I, you, I see a lot of water diversions in these creeks. And last year we had about 25 that we had to visit all of them and inform the, the people that they could no longer do that and they had to remove their um, diversions or sump pumps. My favorite reason for all these regulations, next. So, um, this is kind of a, the same thing that I had before, and I don't know why I didn't remove this one, but flood control can go into a creek and actually open up for flood passage to convey the water flows as long as they retain a canopy. So if there's an emergency and something needs to be removed from a creek, uh, as long as the canopy is present, we will allow some vegetation to be trimmed away from the flow. Next. So this is a photograph of a um, tidewater goby. They are found, they can go up about four miles upstream depending on the, um, the steepness of the creek. They um, are found mostly in estuaries. Um, I'm trying to think of a one that there are in the Mission Can in the Mission Creek estuary. Um, but they're not always present. They come in and out. The danger for them is high storm flows and they'll be washed out to sea. And they they need mud to survive and uh, they can take warmer temperatures. Next. They're tiny. Brackish lagoons. Oh, I should have just read this. Huh? You, f you find them periodically in just about any brackish lagoon. Okay, next. And we have the federally listed red leg frog. Next. They need aquatic vegetation to lay the eggs along the bank. They lay the eggs in water. They don't live in water. They actually move on dry land and hide in vegetation or burrows. They can actually migrate several miles. One interesting thing about Red Lake frogs is the county needed to relocate some frogs, adult frogs, at uh, the Higuas landfill. And so they moved adult frogs to their property just east of Tahiguas to a creek that has been restored. Well, majority of the adult frogs crawled out of their new creek up huge hill through the land uh, waste area and back to their pond. So now we've learned that when you relocate frogs, you have to relocate them as tadpoles. Next. This is a really cool snake. Um, it's our only aquatic snake. Next. They require willow riparian habitat. 
and they are state listed species of concern. That means they have protection, but not quite like an endangered species. I have found one in a habitat I would have never guessed that would even contain um, a two stripe. It didn't have any riparian and, but there it was. So you never know where you're gonna find these species. Next. So as far as mammals, um, they use the creeks to navigate their territories, especially the prey animals, deer. Um, if you're in a creek, you're below the line of sight from the predators. The predator will see across the creek, but not down below. Of course, water source. If we have water, bears and mountain lions aren't gonna come in your backyard to sit in your pool and drink. Uh, creeks are used for shelter and food. And as long as we have bobcats, mountain lions, coyotes, and foxes, we those species are going to keep the, the rodent population in check. Now I have ringtails here. Ringtails are probably one of the neatest animals. You're not gonna ever see them unless you're extremely lucky. They're extremely nocturnal and very shy. They're a raccoon family, but they look like a weasel and the cutest damn things you'll ever see. And they are great um, predators of rats and mice. Next. They also sleep in the trees. As an example of a fox. I've had to remove some of these because this PowerPoint was too long. So next, please. So just a few of the other species. This is an um, American badger. We have a good population around Santa Maria, Lompoc, and um, even into Buellton. They're burrowing animals. Mountain lions, of course, they're everywhere. Um, you may not see them, but we have a very healthy population in our hills. Next. California black bears. This was taken um, in a tree along a bike path in Carpinteria Creek, uh, no, Santa Monica Creek, where people, where kids walk back and forth to school. So they're, they're, they're everywhere. Next. That was a good sized bear. Black tailed deer, of course. Next. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Natasha. And now we've got Mo Gomez, our final panelist. Take it away, Mo. Great, thank you everyone. Let me get my screen connected. I wanna start off by saying thank you very much to the Urban Creeks Council for organizing this event, as well as to all the members of the Creek Week um, organizers from the different cities, city of Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, Goleta, and County of Santa Barbara. You guys do an amazing job annually to put this event together. It really gives us all an opportunity to connect and share information about what we are doing um, my name is Mauricio Gomez. I'm the director of a small nonprofit organization called South Coast Habitat Restoration. And I'm going to give a little talk today about some of the work that we've been doing. And when Lewis approached me, he asked me, sent a nice, very nice detailed email. He said, just talk about whatever excites you about your work. And so I'm excited that I'm going to be able to share with you what I get excited about in my work. And uh, there's a couple of projects that we've been working on. Although they're not in the urban environment, um, I think they're still fitting to the topic. And I wanna thank my previous speakers as well with all that background information, um, because I did leave a, leave a few things out of the presentation. So with Natasha, George, and Anne, everything that you guys spoke about, I think it'll be fitting to fill in some of the, the gaps here. So let me go ahead and get started. Again, so about South Coast Habitat Restoration. Again, we're a small nonprofit organization and our mission is to protect, conserve, and restore the various habitats and native biodiversity of the Santa Barbara and Ventura region. Well, what do we do? We do landowner outreach and identification for projects that we're interested in trying to restore the environment on. We apply for and manage grants from various state and federal agencies to work on projects. We coordinate consultants, everything from biologists to land use planners to engineers, um, and then do designing for some of the work that we do. We obtain permits on behalf of landowners to then implement projects and then 
ultimately what we end up getting to do is the fun part. The part that excites me is we hire and oversee contractors that get to bring in the big yellow equipment to do some a little bit of destruction to make the creek look better in the long run. As part of that work, we then follow up and do monitoring of permit conditions. A lot of the work that Natasha talked about there, we need to make sure that things are being done properly by contractors. And then we do a lot of community outreach and education, such as what we're doing this afternoon or this evening. So today I'm gonna to talk about the Davy Brown and Munch Creek Fish Passage Project. So this is a really exciting project for me. I've been working on this project for over 15 years, and I'm very happy that I'm able to share with you all this evening a progress update on some of the work that we've been doing. Last year, I spoke a little bit about some of the work that we started. I'll do a really quick overview of that work and then expand on some of the continued work that we're doing this afternoon, or that, we, that we're doing this year. So the project goal for the site is to increase access to a little over three miles of habitat for the federally endangered steelhead trout by removing three migration barriers in the Los Padres National Forest. We have a lot of partners and funders and engineers and different uh, um, uh, partners on the projects, including the Forest Service, the San Andreas Band of Chumash Indians. Our funders, of course, include a lot of great um, partner agencies that we work with, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, the State Coastal Conservancy, the County of Santa Barbara Coastal Resource Enhancement Fund, California Fish Passage Forum, Caltrout, various engineers, our bridge manufacturer, Contact and Big R, as well as our general contractor working on the project is Peter Lapidus Construction based out of Carpinteria, as well as the California Conservation Corps. If that wasn't enough of a mouthful, you can see it visually or graphically here with all the different logos that have been part of this project over the years, um, as well as a couple that, that I didn't mention in the previous slide, but are part of this effort as well, because a colleague of ours, that works in the steelhead uh, field, um, uh, Matt Stecker with Stecker Ecological. He identified these sites through a assessment that was done back in the early 2000s as part of some work that he was contracted under um, grant funding from the California Coast Conservancy. He did an assessment of the Santa Maria River watershed and as part of that assessment, he came across these barriers that I'm gonna go into and talk a little bit about his efforts as, long, as well as those with the engineering firm called Mike Love and Associates ended up beginning some of that work, I said oh, about 15 plus years ago. And so we as a nonprofit have been in the position of applying for grant funding on behalf of the Forest Service to try and bring these projects to fruition. And again, I mentioned that we're excited about that because we actually got to start that. And before I get to there, I just wanna orient us all where, we're, where the project is. Um, hopefully you all can see on the screen here this overview map of the Santa Maria River watershed. Major tributary is the Sisquoc River watershed. I know Lewis knows this area very well. He often sends me emails with beautiful pictures of very um, exciting pools and, and, and stuff he finds in the backcountry there. I highly encourage you all to take a visit out there um, when things are, 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 are a little bit more safe for everybody. Right now the Forest Service is actually closed due to fire um, threats. And so at this point, the, the area is closed to access, but in the future, um, please get out there and enjoy the, the wildlife that's out there. Just to zoom in a little bit on that area, um, you can see the project site there with a couple of little pinpoints. I'm also showing the 2007 Zaka Fire perimeter. Um, these sites are actually just outside of the Zaka Fire, which really makes them important for our efforts to try to recover steelhead trout. Um, the source of population in a lot of the areas where the fire took place was really impacted negatively by the sediment that comes after fires and a lot of events that ended up washing out some of the, the in, in decreasing the population of steelhead. And so the, the, the watersheds here for David Brown and Munch Creek, if I can go to the next slide here, um, I've zoomed in on that photo, top right hand side, you can see a little bit of the perimeter still of that fire. And um, hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, here I'm showing Manzana Creek following my cursor. So a tributary to Manzana Creek, if you're going up is Davy Brown Creek. The tributary to Manzana, I'm sorry, to Davy Brown is Munch Creek. And the three project sites that we have been working on from top to bottom include Munch Creek, the Davy Brown site at the upper location and Davy Brown site at the lower location. So I'll first talk about the Munch Creek site. But before I talk about those sites, I wanna show you a few examples of, of some critters as to why we do the work that we're doing. And on this slide, kind of the token um, species that we're talking about here is steelhead trout. 
photograph on the right was a photograph taken in 2005 by a colleague, Matt Secker, um, showing an underwater photo of about a 15 inch trout. Um, on the left is a photo of about a six to eight inch trout that is in one of the tributary creeks in this system. So the fish are out there and, you know, the, the if I can go back a quick second to this bigger map here, the really important part about some of the work that we're working on here in this area is that between the ocean, if you now if fish are navigating all the way up the main stem, up to Sisquak and hit Manzana Creek, there's no major barriers for the fish to get up and over. So that habitat is open for them to get through. And so as fish are migrating upstream and they encounter these sites, these are what needs to come out in order to have more habitat available for steelhead. And so again, here's what they look like. And here's a, a following few other critters that we find out there. This is a photo I took a, about, uh, about four or five weeks ago. This is a red-legged frog that was found out at the near the project site, not at the project site, um, that um, I was really happy to find a pool with a few red-legged frogs in that area. Um, we see a lot of wildlife in this area. It's just, you know, literally the backcountry. And uh, it's just beautiful to see a lot of different species out there. Um, we've installed a couple of game cameras out there. And in these two photographs, you can see some black bear that we um, captured on in some of our project sites out in that back area. Here you can see bear walking through the area. On the photograph on the right, it's kind of hard to see, but if you look in this lower right-hand corner, there is the, the back of a bear. We didn't get a good picture of it, but we got a little bit of it. So um, we've repositioned that camera and hopefully we can get a better view of it next time we're up that way. Additionally, we've seen other things like deer, scorpions at nighttime. Um, oftentimes when we're doing surveys for sensitive species, nighttime is the best time to go out there and look for them. And so I happened to cross this scorpion. It was about two inches long and uh, it, uh, it's one that I don't have a lot of experience playing with, so I definitely don't touch those guys. I just kind of, you know, take a picture and leave. Um, photograph on the right, as I was driving out to the project site, um, I came across a mountain lion, and it was really cool. I stopped, got out of my truck. It was about a thousand feet away from me, and uh, I was able to zoom in on my phone and get a, a photo of it. And as I was watching it, I ended up watching and observing that it was actually hunting two deer, and it was pretty cool. Um, I don't know what happened to the deer, but uh, hopefully somebody um, um, had a good good evening that night. And I'll let you pick who you want to have as a good evening, either the deer or the mountain lion. So what are we doing to try to restore habitat? So this is work that we did um, last year um, with the California Conservation Corps to remove the barrier at Munch Creek. Um, so this is located within the Davy Brown campground, for those of you that are familiar. I'll show you a couple before photographs. This is looking upstream at what was a low flow concrete crossing or what oftentimes is referred to as an Arizona crossing as Natasha mentioned. So these Arizona crossings were installed by the Forest Service in the late 50s in order to provide access across the creek. And another vantage point looking across the creek, creek is flowing from left to right in this photograph. You can see in the background, there's a cattle gate or guard. There used to be access to cattle back in this area, as far as I was told by, per, by Forest Service personnel. And that's why they constructed this access to make it easier for the um, cattle to get back this way. There is no longer access. And so the Forest Service agreed that this would be able to come out in order to improve habitat. So we, with, with grant funding that we were able to receive from the various partners, we brought in the California Conservation Corps based out of San Luis Obispo. And we had a really good team of hardworking young men and women from the CCC, as they're commonly referred to. This is the group of, of young men and women working out there. And we have our tribal monitor from the Payne as Banach Chumash Indians. He's here, the gentleman in the white hat, giving an overview on cultural resources and the importance of that land that we're working on in order to try and restore you know, what was there before. And you know, we're really happy to have him there and connect with the land and teach us about his culture and what we need to be careful about as we're excavating and doing work in the creek. Um, well, with every good project, you got to bring your tools. So here's a little snapshot, some shovels, picks, pipes, a um, bunch of sandbags. Over on the right, these are some electronic, or sorry, gas powered um, um, toters, they call them. Essentially, it's a wheelbarrow that's got like tac uh, uh, tractor um, tracks on it to be able to move large, heavy loads more easily. You need a good crew. Um, here on the left, we've got two of the core members, Meredith and Tori. Um, uh, Meredith is the fish habitat specialist with the CCC. She's been working with me on this project from day one, essentially trying to get these barriers out. So we were happy 
to be able to have her out there. Tori is a core member who's growing some of the native plants for the project. So here she had collected a native plant and she was gonna transplant it and take it back to the center in order to try to get that guy healthy and growing in the future. In the center of the photograph, this is their little camp they had set up last year. Um, it was pretty challenging to work during COVID times during this effort, but I'm happy that we were able to get the crew out there. Um, you can see them wearing their mask over here on the bottom right hand photograph. Um, and they got to work. They started breaking up concrete using um, jackhammers. Um, but before that happened, let me back up um, and say that we had to provide for make sure that any sensitive species weren't going to be in the work area. So we installed a screen across the net in order to make um, the, the access for any fish in that area to not occur. Um, we then had the crew come back out and install a dewatering system in order to keep the area dry. That's on the left hand side connecting the pipes. And on the right, now that the creek is dry, the crew is using jackhammers to break everything up and the, and the concrete basically got pulled away with those toters. And here's what it looked like slowly but surely, they were out there for about a week and little by little, they started basically making almost dust out of that concrete. Um, we discovered some um, netting or sorry, some uh, fencing material that they use for stabilizing the channel there when they were pouring the concrete. And then here, you know, that we found a little groundwater in the creek right there as we were doing that. We were pumping that out up into the upland areas. And little by little, they got the creek channel exposed. And here I can show you the before and after of the photographs. Here on the left is before and on the right is after of the same vantage point. You can see the tree with the Y kind of shape in both photographs for a kind of reference. And we're happy now that the creek has been able to adjust and is now able to allow for fish passage through this area. However, there's still two barriers downstream and that's what I'll talk about next. So um, after a lot of back and forth with uh, getting bids from contractors and permits all squared away, we were able to get all of our grant funding squared away for the project to go forward this year. And um, here's a couple photographs of the lower site. These are the before photographs on the left looking upstream and on the right looking basically um, from the what would be river left bank creek is flowing from right to left in this photograph. Um, um, and so we I'll, sh I'll show you a few photographs of what we've been doing out there over the past um, about a month, a month and a half now. Um, but before we got started, you know, here's um, Jason White, my project manager, who's installing one of our cameras out at the site in order to document and, uh, and get some cool pictures of what the project look, looks like as the course of the project goes from beginning to end. And um, here's a couple of photographs of some heavy equipment work going on in the background, but we also have some individuals in the front here. These are colleagues from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they are one of our grant funders. So they were performing a site visit, doing some pre-project monitoring as part of the work. And we were happy to have them out there overseeing some of the work that was just getting underway at that site. Um, and then we got to work. So here's a few photographs of what I like to see in a creek. You know, that might sound kind of weird for me to say. Usually I like to see creeks flowing with water and fish and frogs and turtles and snakes. However, I really like to see a creek that's been dewatered, that's been fully permitted in order for us to get a contractor in there and tear up the creek. Um, I think George can, you know, maybe support me in saying that, you know, you know, he's done a lot of projects where there's a lot of heavy construction as well. And so here again, Peter Lapidus Construction is doing the work of basically removing all that concrete from the creek channel. Um, I've got a couple photographs here. Usually you make a big pile. So here's the pile being broken up into smaller pieces of concrete so that they can then um, pull it out of the, the project site. And uh, here's a couple side-by-side -side comparison photographs here on the left is the before. And it's a very similar photo on the right, although different orientation. Um, you can see that that concrete has almost been completely removed in this photograph. And again, these are the days that make me happy and make me excited about doing some of the work that I do. Um, and as of, uh, about two and a half weeks ago, this is what the project site looked like. Um, the contractor was beginning to do, uh, he had excavated down to the lower elevation for the new bridge abutment. Probably I should have mentioned, I apologize that. As part of our work, what we're proposing to do here is remove these creek crossings at the lower site and upper sites and replace them with vehicular bridges in order for the public to get across the creek safely, as well as having the fish get through the creek. As Natasha was saying, permitting now, um, essentially requires us to put in a bridge in order for the habitat to be as accessible as possible for the federally endangered trout. In this case, we're putting in these 
large bridges, about 65 feet spanning um, uh, the, the creek. And so the plywood forms that you see in the forefront of the photograph is where the abutment is going to go or foundation for the um, support of the bridge. Essentially, where the truck is parked in this photograph is where the creek will be flowing. And then on the far side of the photograph, you can see another hole, and that's where the other abutment is going to go. So you can imagine there will be a clear spanning bridge where we'll be able to have vehicles driving over it and then the creek flowing through there. I mentioned earlier that the forest is currently shut down. And as part of that, that included shutting it down for us as well. Um, we weren't very thrilled about having the contractor not work at the, at the site. However, we understand the requirements and making sure safety is being upheld for everybody. And so the contractor pulled off a, a project site and uh, we're awaiting um, Thursday morning to arrive because that's when we'll be getting back out into the creek. And as I mentioned, this area of the Forest Service is already closed due to public access as a result of construction. So please do not try to go back out there at this time as it is uh, closed to the public. Um, and so, sorry, one second. And so what we'll begin later this week is the crews will get back out on site. They'll continue doing the form work. They'll bring in the rebar in order to do the rebar setting, which will then be followed up shortly thereafter with the concrete trucks to come in and start pouring concrete for the new bridge abutments, foundation and wing walls. And that'll be followed up with the installation of the new bridge. So again, that's the current state of the lower site. At the upper site, this is the before photograph um, from a couple of vantage points. Again, same idea here. We're gonna rip this road crossing out and replace it with a clear spanning bridge. Um, and this is what that site looks like right now. Um, kind of hard to see in this photograph here, but the creek is literally would be flowing. Hopefully you can see my cursor essentially from the right side um, of the, actually, I think I can annotate if I remember how to do this. The creek is basically flowing through this section or will be flowing. Um, it's dry at, as, uh, at this time, but that's the, the, the path of, of the creek. And so um, the bridge will be going essentially where the ex excavator is, and you can still see some of the remnants of the concrete that was pulled out from the project site. Um, and so I'm really happy that this is where we're at. Um, I wish I had some more exciting photos to show you, but like I said, we're literally stopped. There's no construction activities going on right now. Um, but I hope that if everything goes well, uh, beginning of the end of the week, we'll be able to get back out to the creek and uh, have the contractor continue doing the work. Um, and looking ahead, um, this graphic didn't come out very great, but there's some pin dots here where we're highlighting some of the work that we're also working on in, in our region here in the Santa Barbara Frontier area, beginning with work along Gaviota Creek, El Capitan Creek, Marie Ignacio Creek, Carpinteria Creek, and the Ventura River. And in the next few years, we hope that we'll be removing additional barriers um, from these watersheds in order to improve habitat to the federally endangered steelhead trout. Um, and that is the end of my talk. And I wanna say thank you all very much again, um, Lewis, for all the work you've done with pulling this together. I really appreciate it. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over back to you and, and Cora. Thank you. All right, so now um, I think we have some time for questions. So if you want to uh, use the chat function and send questions in, uh, Cora will get the questions, she'll read the questions, and I think the panelists will let them fight over who gets to answer them. I'd like to add one thing if I could. I did not at the end of my presentation um, give the phone number uh, for reporting any violations. Uh, that any of the creek stewards would find. And it's a Caltip number. It's 888-334-2258. That's 888-334-2258 or Caltip. All right, I have a question directed at me from Gordon. Hi, Gordon, thank you for your question. The budget for the project is about three and a half million dollars that we've uh, been able to pull together from various grant funding sources um, from the initiation of the engineering um, through what we hope will be the end of the, the construction budget. So 
kind of as Natasha was mentioning earlier when we were when she was in her presentation about nonprofits bringing in funding into the area. You know, this is I think a really good example of of a project that you know was able to bring in grant funds from a whole slew of different funding partners that's able to bring in dollars into the local economy and have a positive outcome benefit to um, a cause that you know these funds are, are directed to. Um, some of the funds came from different propositions that were approved by voters. Other funds came from uh, mitigation funding that um, was directed from the Forest Service to us. And so there's a variety of funding sources that we're able to apply for as nonprofit organizations. And we've been doing this for over 15 years now, and we have a really good handle on applying for grant funding from the various state and federal agencies, as well as foundation partners that we work with in order to try and bring in these projects together. And George, you can probably um, add to the importance of bringing in um, grant dollars to our efforts that we're collaboratively working on. Sure, you know, we always try to get grants, especially for construction and acquisition projects. They're very helpful. Um, uh, it's nice that we do at the city have some funding to match. I'm, I'm not sure you guys always do, Mo, so it makes it a little <laughs> more difficult, but um, we have gotten, I think, close to $20 million over the last 20 years in grant funding, so that's pretty good for our projects. We've been able to match a lot of the, the money that we get from the hotel bed tax. Yeah, and just to add to that, you know, as George was highlighting, um, as a nonprofit organization, we don't have Measure B funding that's coming to support us. And um, as part of our work, we write ourselves into the grants whenever we can. And we have a pretty good percentage of getting grant funding, but we don't always get the grants that, you know, we apply for. And uh, it's, it's, it's challenging um, to go after grants and uh, try to keep our our efforts and and you know unlike Lewis at the beginning with his introduction of having a volunteer board you know our nonprofit group you know I wish I was I was able to volunteer my time but you know I I I have a car payment a mortgage payment and a son and got to feed him <laughs> um, so we bring in our funding to help support us and and so it's a it's a different hat that I sort of wear with my work as a result of being a grant writer to being a project manager to, you know, all the different things that we're doing. Got a question from Kathleen here. Mo, are you concerned that the Forest Service closure will delay work into the rainy season? And if so, what, and if so, would that impact the plan? Um, hi, Kathleen, thanks for your question. Um, I am concerned, <laughs> as you probably imagine, hence your question. And we are working very closely with our contractor to see what sort of creative methods he might be able to employ to try to get the project back on track. Um, because I am concerned that the rainy season is coming. Um, this is where it gets challenging for us as somebody who loves water. I don't always love water when we have a construction project and we don't want to see a construction site full of rainy, you know, uh, conditions where we might have um, difficulties with, you know, regulatory agencies and permitting conditions on our projects. And so um, our, our plan is basically to have the contractor, you know, work as hard as he can with his crew out there. And uh, um, we are going to be doing some adaptive management uh, depending on what happens. Um, and that's really the best answer I think I can give you, Kathleen, because um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. You know, we don't know when Mother Nature is going to throw us its first storm. As of right now, looking at the at the thirty day forecast, we're we're in the clear. Um, even that isn't a great you know telltale for us in our area. But you know, we'll be you know as uh, as diligent as we can in order to protect um, the project site as well as the species, um, um, you know, through this area. Thanks for your question. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question for uh, either uh, George or Natasha. Uh, my understanding about creek access is that um, you're allowed to walk in the stream bank of any navigable waterway, which can be interpreted as if there's enough water in it in the wintertime to float down in a raft, you can walk in it when it's dry. Is that is that true? That has been asked of the 
district attorneys and we don't really have a clear answer um like the San Inez River that should actually hold because it, there are flows that during high rain events, you could technically float down the river. The, the problem is where do you access the river? You still have to cross private property to get into the river. Unless you start in the ocean and walk all the way up, you're still gonna have trespass issues. Um, if you have a public park, then you can enter the river. But again, you know, it's, it's, it's such a difficult question because there's so many variables in this. Property owners are very protective, especially around the San Inez River. They don't want anybody going across. You'll have barbed wire fences that go across some of the streams to keep their cattle in and out. Um, how do you get through that there without trespassing? So we really don't have a definitive answer to that. The only thing I could tell you now is you may have a reasonable argument if you enter the water course through, um, through a public spot. But if not, then you will be um, cited for trespassing or asked to leave. The, sorry, I can't have a better answer than that. Yeah, uh, uh, I we I have not taken it to the attorneys, Lewis. I, I was just pointing out that in many areas the private the property is private on the creek. There are national forest lands. There's county flood control land. There's city county parks where the creeks are um, owned by public organizations. I'm not sure what the access rules are for flood control property but in city property in the parks and city property you are allowed to you know walk onto the creek because it's it's public property but in many areas as i said before uh the the creek itself is privately owned and so you just have to be aware of that and um and you work work around it well do we have any other questions I wanted to make a, a, I guess, a comment, suggestion, uh, and or you know, opportunity for for um, our first speaker, um, Anne, to say something. And I, I wanted to say thank you to her for having the initiative to reach out and get involved with doing some some science um, and, uh, and and getting involved in this field. Um, it's very impressive that at such an early age you were able to. Do something that I don't know a lot of kids would do, um, and so that I think speaks very highly of you. Although I'm just meeting you, um, it's really cool that you got involved, and uh, um, I'm, I'm very thankful for Urban Creeks Council to offering her an opportunity also to get engaged, not only on that volunteer basis, but also on the level of of a board member. Um, there's not a lot of organizations that have young individuals um, getting involved at an early age, and so. Um, I guess it's just more of a comment to both of you guys, both Anne and the, and the, and the Urban Crease Council, you know, thank you guys for, for, you know, getting involved with what you did and, and, you know, I would love to see more um, uh, diverse groups engaged um, with the work that we're doing and, uh, and spread the word to your friends and colleagues to try to get more involved with some of this too. Thank you for that comment, Mo, and thank you, like Urban Creeks Council board members. I, I really appreciate that you like accepted me onto the board when I was like 15 and had no credentials and was just looking to get involved. And I think also like one of the other things that made me like originally reach out to Dan about getting involved was that like I went to a high school and a campus school that really valued like people being involved with the community and Gordon, who was the headmaster at that time is actually here at this forum. And I think that the school really encouraged me to like make connections like that. And I value all of that. Yeah, I wanna co commend you guys also for that. I think the Creek Stewardship Program is a cool idea. The more 
um, eyes and ears we have on different sections of creeks all, all around the south coast, the better, because uh, we, even though we're pretty well funded in the city ourselves, we can't be everywhere at once. And we do rely on people to let us know when stuff's happening um, that maybe shouldn't be or that might be impacting water quality or species or whatever. So we do encourage that program because it, 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 it could be very helpful for us. I'd like to add to that. I agree with George. There's very few of us, and that's why we rely so much on the public. And I think it would be very helpful for all the agencies to have more eyes out there to protect our creek. We have a question in the chat from Brooke. Um, Brooke says, I work as a permaculture designer in the Montecito area. One of my clients' properties lines is right next to the Hot Springs Bank. Where could I find a list of native species that would work well in that area? Well, if nobody's gonna answer. Um... I, I can't, I mean, I can, if you okay. wanna email me, I can give you a list of species, but I don't know of, you know, it is kind of site specific, so might have to talk to you about how shady it is and how sunny it is and how far the the, the, the uh, area is above the creek. As I talked about before, when the water is really cut down, as I'm assuming it is on Montecito Creek after the debris flows, uh, some, that disconnect between the groundwater and the plants means you might have to select the species that are riparian, but a little more drought tolerant. So. Um, my email is gjohnson at santabarbaraca.gov if you want to email me. Um, and I can put it, maybe I can put it on the chat. I don't know how that works. But um, you can also go to sbcreeks.com and get our contact information. I, I can add to that as well that the, I believe it's on Project Clean Water's website, Kathleen. I'm not sure if you have that link available or not, but the um, County of Santa Barbara, as well as the Community Environmental Council, gosh, maybe 16, 17 years ago, put, to, put together a guide called the Santa Barbara Creek Care Guide, um, which has some pretty helpful information in it. Um, and I believe there's a PDF of it on the county website. Um, and uh, I also uh, might be able to assist um, and I'm happy to share any information, um, the different plant species that are out there. My email address is mgomez at schabitatrestoration.org. I would like to add to that. If you, the, your client has funds, you could hire a, a biological consultant and do a survey of the area and then you will know exactly what is there or and what should be there. Uh, sometimes that is the easiest and quickest way of doing a survey and knowing how to um, do any restorations that you'll have to do or get a good idea of what, what you can remove and what you can't remove. I'd also like to add that uh, anybody who's listening to the program, um, feel free to um, email us at the uh, Urban Creeks Council and we can forward your emails or contact you about uh, resources and or people that might be able to help you. All right, then I guess we'll uh, call it an evening and I just wanna thank everybody for participating. This was a really amazing program. I'm really glad you all could uh, make it to present and for the public who um, is watching this, so stay tuned. And like I um, said earlier, um, look at the schedule for Creek Week and you'll see a whole bunch of really great programs and we'll be doing a couple more. So stay tuned and we'll be in touch. Thanks everybody for uh, coming out.